earn a reward by getting on the place. Well, they hop on the place. Really effective. But the problem with it for me is, yeah, but they jump off right away. And then yeah. they jump on again. And then they jump off again and they jump on. Well, every time they jump on it, we reward them. Every time they jump off of it, they get to jump back on and get a reward. So in order to get another reward, what do they They're have to do? Breaking. They got to jump off. My goals are with place training is go on your place and don't come off. Move around all you want but don't come off until I initiate them to come off. So like, it's the opposite. I'm not teaching them to go on it, but that bed is elevated enough that it's a very black and white thing. It makes it easy for me to have good timing. It makes it easy for them to understand. Every dog can do this because it's easy. They understand that this is the rules, whether you're there or not. Like that's habit. When it becomes habit, it's been consistent and repetitious enough to become like all they know. Guys, if we had issues, it usually was nothing to do with that dog. It was usually how I set it up. I'm a person that preaches it a lot, but sometimes I gotta listen to my what I'm saying myself. And I caught myself several times throughout this. Well, I gotta get something done by a certain time because of this. It was always in the back of my mind. And that got in the way, I think, of us accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish. So I really had to tell myself, and I continue to have to tell myself, whenever you get there, it's okay. Jeremy yeah. Moore, we finally get to meet in person and uh, on For the floor sure. of Pheasant Fest at the Yukonuba booth. Uh, so far, who's the most popular dog? It seems like it's Makina. I, it's a toss up. Yeah, I think Makina's kind of stealing the show though. She's a uh, well, she's got the most energy. You yeah, know, so I think uh, she attracts. She attracts people just with that. She and that's something about her personality. She's just a. She's a good. Sh she shows really well. Yeah, like she's got. She's got a real inviting personality. Where you know the labs are are real beautiful in their way too but they're so you almost don't notice them right um half the time people don't realize they're there but makina lets you know she's there yeah but all three of those dogs it's their first this is their first show so i'm i was about to ask how often do they actually get to go to shows these ones this we much distractions right these ones we haven't i mean we do we've over the years we've done a lot of shows and we always bring dogs but um first time for them and i I think they handled it really well. I think it was really interesting yesterday because it's a great example for people. Like, Makina, I don't know, we started at noon, I guess, and by about 3, 30, 4 o'clock, Makina finally laid down. You know? <laughs> but she, she stood the whole time, and she was, you know, she can't move anywhere. She's on her bed, but um, tons of interaction with people. You know, obviously real stimulating environment. And the other dogs were wiped out sleeping you know by by 233 yeah by 334 she was laying down and she was her eyes were closing with her head up i mean she was fighting it you know mm -hmm. but i what i told what I, when it happened i was i mentioned it to a couple of people i said here's the perfect example if you had you know if they were carrying apple watches they had about 50 steps yesterday they didn't move much but they were exhausted after riding in a car for you know i don't know a total of probably 12, 12 hours between that, you know, in that 24 hour window. And so they didn't do much physically, mm -hmm. but they were as tired as they would have been if we had hunted all day. And it was all due to that mental stimulation. So I, I, my point to some of the folks that were there was if you can balance, if I can figure out and we can figure out how to balance our exercise, quote unquote, with both physical and mental stuff, you get, I think you get so much more of it because I think you gain from the mental part. You, the physical part, I don't know how much you always gain from. I think you, you know, I've, I, I think some people exercise their dogs as a means of like, yeah, wearing them out or giving, you know, letting them, letting them, you know, burn energy, which is totally true. It makes sense, but really, you're conditioning them, and they, and you're just you're conditioning them to be able. You're to go building further. a bigger gas tank. Yeah, really. you're 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 making them better athletes, and it's you're making it harder on yourself. It's harder to tire out a dog that's in really really good shape. Yeah. So what do you have to do? Well, you got to run. You got to run them even longer. more. So I I think the the big takeaway was like, boy, I, if you can really work on balancing those two every day with everything you do, between the mind and the feet, I always say you know got to have them both got to have their heads and you got to have their feet and you probably don't have to run them 
nearly right. as much as, no. as some think you do. But yesterday there was no running. It was all mental. And I, I do think they were, I mean, I know they were exhausted. Well, and I mean, something like this where so many people, I always love seeing people's reaction when they get to see, maybe they haven't seen dogs in this environment. Just chill, yeah. just be perfectly yeah. content yeah. to chill on their place. And it's a testament to where, regardless of breed i mean obviously you you have your labs here which i think a lot of people you know labs place training like you you see that a little bit more often but showing that an english setter in this environment it's the same yeah. rules it's the same concept you dog's know dog's a dog when it comes yeah. to that stuff i always say and, and i th i do think like I, I i think that's the part that's probably most interesting to this crowd and it's a bird dog crowd obviously so i do think that it's probably the thing that they're surprised at because you're not going to see you're right, not, you're not going to see that probably that often, and it's not because they can't do it; it's because people don't do it. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I think some people don't do it because they don't think they can. And I, I don't know if nothing else. I hope people go, boy, maybe you can do that with other dogs, absolutely, you know, other breeds. But I mean, there's proof right here, proof of concept. Yeah. It's a testament that you're standing here talking to me. We're doing a podcast while complete strangers are over there petting yeah. your dogs and you know you're keeping an eye on them you're we're not just like c turning a complete blind eye to them right, right? they are dogs and right. they could just you know leave the place but you have confidence I, how do you advise people with that they come to you they're like i want that sure you know how well, do you start breaking that down for somebody to make sense that your a, dog can do that really good question because i've we have i've had that conversation a couple times today already was where uh, just five minutes ago a, per, a couple came up and said so tell me about this, you know, how, uh, what, tell me more about this. Well, and I, I do think that place training, that terminology, I would say it's, I mean, I mean, I think it's become very, very popular. It's become, yeah. There's, there's programs built around it and, and training theories behind, you know, built around this, this idea. I would say part of the reason why I'm able to do this with them is because I do not do any of that stuff. Like it is completely different for me. It's not wrong. I'm not saying that stuff is wrong. I've never used a place board in the field. I've never used a place board for steadiness. I've never used a place board for handling with dogs. I've never sent dogs to a place board. I've never casted dogs off of place boards. I've studied it. I've watched videos. Ian Openshaw's videos I've watched. I, I don't do it. And here's because I want to do this. Okay. So for me, place is very much a, a, it's a controlled spot that they won't make a mistake in. And it's really safe for them. And it's very functional for me as a dog owner. In my house, we've got places. Dogs lay on the places. At a show, I've got a place. Dogs laying on the place. So what I think, pro I think par part of the issue that people have is, and it, it again, it's, I'm not, I'm not saying this to say it's wrong to do it other ways, but it creates some of the struggles because what they're trying to, what some people are trying to get out of place training is a different end result. You got to always think about what are you trying to accomplish with it? Well, when you, when you use a place to teach a dog to handle your, your goal is to get the dog to handle cast to the right, go to the right, cast to the left, go to the left, go back, go back. The place is a tool that they're using to get that behavior. I don't want the dog leaving that place and I don't want the dog going to that place. And I've seen some, some spots where they really allow the dog to kind of free choice to get onto the place, earn a reward by getting on the place. Well, they hop on the place. Yeah. It's really effective. They're learning to learn. I think is how a lot of people describe that. But the problem with it for me is, yeah, but they jump off right away and then yeah. they jump on again and then they jump off again and they jump on. Well, every time they jump on it, we reward them. Every time they jump off of it, what, what, what happens for them? They get to jump back on and get a reward. So in order to get another reward, what do they they're have to do? They got to jump it. off. So it's, it's a totally different objective that they're trying to accomplish. What my goals are with place training is go on your place and don't come off, move around all you want, but don't come off. Mm -hmm. So when I teach a dog to place, whether they're little or old, when they get on there, they don't come off until I initiate them to come off. So like it's the opposite. I'm not teaching them to go on it. I'm te teaching. I'm. I'll teach them to come off of it when I tell you to come off, and that ends the session. That ends the behavior. So, but if I tell you to go back onto it, that's per. That's like a permanent. Yeah. Now you can move. So it's kind of like it's it's similar for me to like if I teach a dog to sit. They shouldn't move until I ask them to come off of that sit. Well, it's some will say, well that's stay. Yeah, same thing. 
Yeah, it's so, built into it. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same thing. The difference for me with like sit and stay is if I tell a dog to stay, I don't. I don't call them off of it. I'm making it very clear. This is like a permanent thing. I'm gonna come back to you and I'll take you off a of stay. If I tell a dog to sit, there's certain points in training where I do have to move a dog. I got to put them somewhere for a while and then I got to move them and I don't want to have to go back to them to move them. So for me, if I tell a dog to sit, I'm okay with calling them off. There's some, there's some, some things that I, when I teach a dog to sit to the whistle, I put the dog on a sit. I might back up from them, call them to me and then stop them on the whistle. So like it's, it's creating a little bit of distance. They take two, three steps and I stop them again and sit so they have to already understand the concept of sitting and i i do that kind of in a heel position but i'll call a dog off of that sit in that scenario because my objective is come to me move again and then stop at a distance mm. so i don't want to i want to try to make it easy for them to understand so if i'm, I'm not telling a dog sit stay and then calling them to me and trying to stop my whistle i'll say sit back up call them to me sit call them to me sit so i make it two three repetitions of Take a step, sit, take a step, sit. And it's all stopped on that whistle. But I'm not going to, so I'm not going to confuse those two. With place, place is place. Yeah. Don't come off that. And you, so, you and, I, and I never struggle with it. Right. Well, and you sent, me, you sent me a video like last year sometime of Makina when you were doing that with her yeah. as a puppy. Yep. And it it's like you described, you're not training place like most people train place. You're not luring, you're not rewarding nope. to jump on. But you're just sitting there. I think you're sitting at the table working, and yep. it's just like, you know, I'm working. And it's like, yeah, I might get to work for 30 seconds to begin with and then correct, you know, right. or, or get her yeah. back on. But but just building that association that, like, no, th this is safe. The floor right. is lava, and you're not right. you're not being – you weren't being forceful. You weren't uh, essentially, like, uh, you weren't luring. You weren't, weren't – you weren't trying to uh, – what's the word? Uh, I can't even think of the word right now. You weren't trying to just get her to do it for the reward. You weren't bribing her. That's yeah, the there word was, I was no. Yeah, about. I don't do it with kibble. I don't. I'm not. This is not a. This is not a rewarded. Like she, the, the she reward, just gave in and laid down, and you're yeah, like, there. There the, we go. The reward for her in that scenario, and I'm I'm big on the idea of pressure and praise. Like it, it, it's it's a balancing thing. And if they do something wrong, they'll receive some pressure. If they do something right, they should receive praise. I think it needs to be clear for them to understand if they're doing the right thing or not. So when, when, in some of those videos, we did it in the same spot. We did it in my kitchen and I work on my computer there. And, and the very first time I did it with her for the first few times I did it with her, it was like hundred percent focused. I had to watch her because she didn't know any better. Yeah. She doesn't know this game. Like you put her up on this little other platform and it's like a launching pad for a puppy. They think it's cool to jump off of it. So as she did that, I was, I knew it was going to happen. So as she did that, I go over and I'm right there to pick her up, put her back on it. And I'd say, nope, put you back. Nope, put you back. Nope, put you back. You do that three, four times in that little bugger. You could see she'd get to the, she'd get ready to go to the edge and then she'd pause. And the second she paused, because she's thinking about it, because she realized every time I jump off of this, that sucker picks me up and tells me no and puts me back on this. And I'm pretty good with my timing on it. The time, the minute she hesitates, she just told me she learned, she learned from those last three, right. four, five times. So the second she hesitates and doesn't jump off, I'm just as quick to say good, good. as I was to say nope and put it back. And so then she looks at me and goes, what? Good. Okay. So then she fools around again, she forgets about it. She might jump off. She might be hesitant, but I, I gauge my reaction based on her behavior. She comes off. No, if she gets, stays up good. And eventually that little dog gets tired of tired of this <laughs> the tension spans short. And usually what ends up happening is they circle around, they check their perimeter. They realize, and that's another part of it. That bed makes the difference for me because it's elevated enough that it's a very black and white thing. You're on it or you're off of it. There's no in between. So it makes my timing, makes it easy for me to have good timing. It makes it easy for them to understand that perimeter. And then I, that's why I say I think it's one of the easiest things for me to do with a young dog. And I do it with every one of them. I do it right away with them all. But I've done it with, I have a workshop. We did a video with a guy that had a five-year-old yellow lab that was real high energy. And he, he told me flat out, he said, you'll never be able to do that with my dog. And I <laughs> okay so i said well, challenge bring, accepted said, bring her here so he brought her here and you know the, everyone's watching and and 
I put her on a lead because I physically can't pick that dog up anymore. She's too big. So I put her on a little slip lead. I put her on the bed. I, I healed her up onto it. She stepped up onto it. And no fault of her own, she just stepped off. She said, well, I don't want to be up here. I'm just, and the second she stepped off, I put correction on her with the lead. And she looked at me and she panicked. She thought, what in the hell was that? And so I, I had, I realized in this video, if you watch it, you'd see it. She, it was a little firm. I was a little firm on that correction, probably firmer than I needed to be. And so she froze. She became a statue. So I had to loosen her up a little bit and kind of build her confidence again. So finally she decides to, she's going to be confident enough. She gets up. She steps off. Well, why wouldn't she? She's never been asked to be on there. The second she stepped off, I corrected again, but it was a lot lighter. And she responded really well. She wagged her tail. She got back up on that bed. We did it about three times. And finally the dog circled around and laid down. And the, I looked at the guy and the guy looked at me and he, he looked like I was doing magic. You know, like I was a, a wizard of some sort. And I said, look, every dog can do this because it's easy. It's just don't step off. Now I said, but here's the thing. She's not done. Like you can't say, yeah, oh, she's not trained. proof. Yeah. Because now you'll have to do this going forward all the time every time and it'll take a lot longer for you to have a reliable dog on place where like these dogs i i went to the bathroom before i will i'll go down the my setter gets a little excited she wants to know where i'm at these guys i don't know that they even know i'm gone like they're just <laughs> but but i but i it takes a while to build up that confidence that you can leave the room leave and they understand that this is the rules whether you're there or not like that's habit that's that that when it becomes habit it's been consistent and repetitious enough to become like all they know and so when you start with a little one that they don't know the op they don't know the alternative when you start with an older one you got a lot of habit to change which that habit was i don't understand this i yeah. have no idea what this little thing is so i think it's a pretty easy thing well, and I mean, so much of that is like, yeah, we're just talking place, but place training essentially, but the timing of what you're talking about, instead of rewarding for them to come on it, you're rewarding oh, them on their, that's it. on their impulse control. Like she wanted to go off. You saw that hesitation. You saw that connection. And so you're connecting the dots. It's like, yes, what you just thought right there, was I, I want more of that. Yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, so and, it's my purpose with it is different. I don't use it as a, and the reason, and I have no problem with folks that use it for other reasons. It's just, I don't, because I've, I don't think I've ever felt a need to, like I, I get to, I get a dog to handle differently. Like I, I'll put a dog up against a fence line and I'll put, set white dummies on the side and I'll give There's I'll only make it, one way for I'll them make to it go. very easy yeah. for them to realize, man, I got to run like 90 degrees. And <laughs> yeah. so I don't necessarily I've never run into a dog that I couldn't do that with. So I've never had to figure out a different way of doing it. Right. Um, but there's, you know, and, and so there's. It's, well, and I like how you different... phrase that. You never had to figure out another way. You're not saying that there isn't other ways or that totally. you may never have to. You just up till now. You right. haven't had to. Right. And I think if you do it the other way, you'll gain. I'm not saying it doesn't work because I know it works. I've seen it. But what I think it does is it makes this harder. Because right. it, because it makes it harder to do what I want them to do from a, what a, there. It depends on what your definition is of place training. My definition of place training is go be on your place and don't come off. Other people's place training, or the use of place boards for training, accomplishes other objectives. Yeah, I don't I don't use them because I think it muddies the waters for this behavior. Yeah. And I mean, it, you could train it this way. And then to your point, you take that place board out into the field. It's going to water down what you built into the house yeah. because it, to your point, it's like you, the, when we are training, you have to hit that repetition. Like you have to get enough reps to where it registers with the dog's brain. So if you're constantly getting those reps and to your point, go on, go off, go on, go off, right. go on, go off. It's the opposite. We're asking them to do something different Yeah, using the same thing. So I, you know, maybe you could, maybe, I don't know if it would make a difference or not. Maybe you could use different boards. I was, you know, I was just about totally to ask. Totally different like, type of platform. You, you talked about so the elevated. Associated. Yeah, you that said the work. elevation one, you know, maybe like, I was going to ask if you thought that maybe that would make a yeah. difference to where if you just had might. a flat board or something. Yeah, might. I, I just, again, the, the stuff, for, the reason I don't do it is because I've just never run into a, point where i went boy i really got to figure out how a better way to do this right just hasn't been for me but 
Well, and we, we spoke about the difference between your labs are just, you know, they don't even know if you leave the room, your yeah. setter's a little bit more aware of where you're at, but she's still doing the same exact behavior here. Uh, yeah, today, I, what, I, right now I think is the first time today she's laid she's down. She's laid down. Yeah. She's just nestle, nesting up with her. And, yeah. I, and I'm, you know, what I'm really glad about is because I'm not there. I, yeah. what, what, even watching this happen is, for me personally, I like it because she's showing me what, that's the behavior I like. That's a behavior I would like to see her do. I don't mind if she's standing up because that's in her too. But for her to be able to just relax like that tells me mentally she's either really exhausted, which yeah. she probably is, or she's just come to this point where she's gotten okay with the idea of, hey, he's not like right next to me right now, that's me, okay. me personally, and she's cool with it. If she got real fussy and antsy, I wouldn't have been surprised because she really loves me <laughs> and I love her too. But... <laughs> I also feel like I don't I don't desire that. I want a dog that is comfortable. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh nice to be around, not not fussy, not whiny. Just but I say all the time the dogs with the with the good manners, they get to enjoy more things in life. Yeah. They get to go to places like this. And, not, and you know, we talk about building it up to where okay, you create this behavior in the house to controlled environment, quiet. You know, do you, would you recommend to the average person to go from quiet home to something as stimulating as like this? Or would you say, like, go to Lowe's or Tractor yeah. Supply first? Eventually, yeah. I think everything's got to be incremental. You know, like, I, I think it's just, I think you always, and I think that's with everything, not just something like place training. I think it's everything you do in training. I, I try to make it so sterile to start out with the environment, like, as few distractions as possible. Because there's less variables to yeah. make to make it hard and then i think you but then i think you can't get sucked into thinking that your dog has it if they can do it in that really sterile environment because as soon as you put them into an environment that's got a little distraction they won't be able to do it so i i and then you're you're stuck so i think what a natural progression with everything we do in training should be start in the simple easy stuff add a layer Add a layer, add a layer, and the layer could be distraction. The layer could be more, more complicated, whatever, yeah, yeah. complicate it somehow. Um, but that's that's the idea of just incrementally adding to stuff until you feel like you can put them in just about any environment, plug them into it, and they'll perform despite all the outside distractions. That's that to me. That's a trained dog. They're not trained the way I. They're not trained for me to the to where i want them to be if they can't do it in just about any any situation yeah um doing it in a teed up spot like it's a perfect set er, steadying makina i'm steadying her up right now to wing and shot because of some field trial stuff that i'm going to try to do with her i'm i that that is is it's real fresh in my mind right now of when we first started out with it it had to be in a really as much of a controlled environment as possible and then i mean we're talking about getting a dog steady to birds flushing and and there's a lot of you can't do that in your hallway like you know like it, it's it's got to be out out in a world of of some distraction that's going to be there but i simp i had to simplify that as basic as i could to accomplish the goal of just don't break don't move your feet when that bird goes and then she got and that was hard to begin with but then we did it a few times and there were opportunities to make good corrections when she made mistakes. There were opportunities to tell her she did it right when it, when it went well. And it was the exact same thing as that dog bed. It's just on a, on a more complicated level. And then she learned from it and then she got pretty good at it. And so then we went, then I, if I, if I set that exact same scenario up day after day, after day, after day, by the time we did it for a while, it was perfect. Well, she certainly wasn't done. So then, but some people I think would think, well, she's done. Look at that. Yeah. So then it was, okay, we'll change something. So typically I would change something. I'd maybe get a little aggressive and I'd make it a little bit too much of a change and she'd fall flat on her face. And I'd either decide, okay, was it close enough to just repeat it similar to what we just did and be better with my timing and anticipate what was going to go wrong and be ready for that? Or was it make it a little easier? Not quite as easy as last time, but but not quite as hard as this time. And get in the middle somewhere and then set it up again. And if she did it but didn't do it perfect, well, we'll do that again. And after a couple of days of that, she's got it. Okay, let's add another thing. Let's add it. So it's been a progression for me with pigeons and launchers, the 
some Johnny House quail, wild birds. It's, and, and I've jumped back and forth with some of those. And I've been surprised with some of it, pleasantly surprised. I've been pretty surprised at some of it where I was like, God, I just feel like this shouldn't be so hard. But almost always when I realized, when I really look back on it, I would recognize if we had issues, it usually was nothing to do with that dog. It was usually how I set it up. Yep. And if I got better at that and learned from whatever we did the last time and did it a little better the next time we've made, as long as you're moving forward yeah, and as long as we're progressing and you know, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a person that preaches it a lot, but sometimes I got to listen to my, what I'm saying myself. And I, I caught myself several times throughout this where I was, I was concerned with why aren't we going any, well, I got to get something done by a certain time because of this i got it it's, ha it's hard not to fall into that totally for anybody totally and and every time i did it it made it it made it Worse. really hard to, to to make progress because it was always in the back of my mind and that got in the way i think of us accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish so i really had to tell myself and i continue to have to tell myself you just keep moving forward just keep moving forward and and if you get where you want to get Whenever you get there is okay, yeah. whether it's quicker or, or whether it takes me longer or, or less time. And when you can get to that point, which is why I like, which is why I like um, the idea of, and, I, and we, we put such an emphasis on the idea of folks training their own dogs. Because I'm not under, you know, I have clients' dogs, but few, very few of them, and they're all trained like my, like my own. Which means there's no, I don't have time pressure. I don't have windows. I talk with so many trainers that are friends of mine that, that do it a more traditional way where dogs come in for periods of time and that it is their biggest stress. It's their biggest struggle. It's the biggest thing that they, that it always, when we start talking, it always comes back to. And I go, man, wouldn't it be nice if you just didn't have, didn't a, have, didn't have a deadline? Yep. And they just, yeah, yes, it would, but I, <laughs> but I don't, but I can't do that. And I totally get that and understand it. I don't have that issue yeah and most people that train their own dogs don't and shouldn't have that issue it'll be like a self-imposed deadline Absolutely. you know they'll they'll sign up for a test or a trial yeah before like anticipating that like oh here's my game plan here's here's my path forward my road my the road that we're going to go down and they just assume that we're going to be there right, right? and it right. doesn't it doesn't right. it, it very rarely has room for hurdles or right. hiccups right and what do they do instead of canceling or delaying the test or trial to the next season or year they're going to push forward yeah and and it is hard you get caught up into it to where you know we all want we want our dogs to be successful there's a reason why we're out there spending our time spending our money spending our attention learning and all this other stuff but we say it and to your point, I fall in the trap too, is don't go into any training session expecting perfection. Look for improvement. And if yeah. you're not looking for something to improve, what are you actually training for, right? Like, you know, I've had some people like, well, I've trained up to this level. I just want them to do it perfect because I know they know how to do it. And it's like, well, that's not technically training in my book. That's just, you know, going out there and and throwing a rep out there right, right? like right. there's no intention behind it what, what is the goal behind it right and if you're just going out there trying to have fun with your dog cool but then to me you shouldn't have really expectations in line with that if that makes sense yeah i think it's you know it i agree with the idea of you really have to and i i get caught i get i get mixed up in it myself where i i lose the focus at times of what's the objection what what what's the objective what am i really trying to accomplish with this not just to do it yeah it's to do it to do this or to do that and and at times you end up sacrificing some things to gain other things and that's balancing stuff and so another a, a perfect example of that is again with the steadiness of her steadying her up and when I say steady, I say steady and people breaking their dogs out, but I don't like using the word break. Yeah. Because I think break has a really definite um, understanding of what does that mean? Well, you have to break it. What? How do you break it? What happens when it's broken? They're, take, they're it, it talking about broken. I don't want to broken it, anything. <laughs> it, it comes from when they talked about like you have to break the dog from that behavior. And, and it's like now I, I, I like the saying 
we no longer break dogs. We train dogs. Yeah. Because back in the day, that's really what they did was they just, and that's why also a lot of dogs were washed out because it's like, you know, you're, you're either, you're getting the dog that you wanted or you're getting and they're just, or they're just saying that that dog can't do it. Right. right and right. now I think that there's so many trainers out there that have figured out ways to where like, Hey, that dog may not have the drive to take that level of pressure quote unquote, breaking the dog right. of that behavior. Now let's go about it at a different angle. Yeah. And I, but def, defined wise, like a broke dog, you know, as a dog is steady, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but, but I, but I go, I've, I've thought about this an awful lot. I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to write a, uh, one of my columns for gun dogs going to be about it. But when you, I've asked, I've, it, this dawned on me talking with a professional trainer um, in the last two years. So since I got Makina, but I, I, what I, what I think is interesting is to think about it when you talk about breaking a dog upland, you know, for steadiness. Because I think it refers to, you can refer breaking to a lot of stuff. You can mm -hmm. break them off game, you know, break them, it, breaking horses, about all the, it's, it's all, we're all kind of talking about this same idea. I think most people are, but I, I asked this guy, I said, the way he described breaking the dog, breaking his, his pointing dog, I asked him, I said, spell that for me. And he, he goes, what? Spell what? I said, spell what you, spell what you just said you're going to do to your dog and he said what word i said break because i heard him describe it in a way of b-r-a-k-e put brakes, put brakes on, on the, the dog. dog and i said is that what you meant by that and he goes well yeah, i guess yeah I've, i'm gonna put brakes on him put the brakes on him okay and i go well that's a hell of a lot different to me than b-r-e-a-k so if you break the dog or you break the dog depending on how you spell it makes an Matters. awful different and to me it makes a difference on your approach yeah because if you're a gladiator going into a <laughs> ring and you're gonna break that guy you're gonna crush him yeah right if you're gonna go in and put brakes on a dog you're gonna teach the dog to stop because that's what you need you need brakes so i thought man that's a real interesting difference of it just changed my mind it changed my my feelings about that process totally dependent on how it was spelled yeah. So I'm not into broken anything because if it's broken, you have to fix it. I don't want to fix stuff with my dogs. I'm trying to avoid breaking stuff. So, but the, I, so that it's semantic, but the idea for me with, with this, this whole process of it really was the idea of get, get her some brakes, you know, put brakes on her when in the face of, in the, in the face of real temptation, which is that bird. Mm -hmm. so it's 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 been a I, it's been a this is this is the kind of stuff that i never would have thought about that's why i say that that setter has taught me more about training and i've only had her she's, she turned two in november she's taught me an awful lot about training because she's forced me to think about things differently and i've i've become a i think i've become a better retriever trainer because of her only because i have to think about it differently and i think there's a lot of that stuff that i with with her that is a different a bit of a different approach that probably could be applied towards my labs and any any retriever but you just don't think about it because those are two different dogs and you train them differently and blah blah blah, blah. well the dog is the dog and, yeah and there are there are some differences but there's an awful lot of similarities so but yeah I, it's it's interesting i this the field trial stuff with her, I'm not, I'm not competitive with dogs. I've never competed with a dog. I ran her as a derby um, twice last year, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to run her this year as she's age she's a off age dog, so she has to be a shooting dog this year. Well, guess what? Got to be bro got to be broke, you know, got to break her. So, in order to run her as a shooting dog, if I want to, she's got to be pretty reliably steady by a certain date, which is not that far away. And so I have gone back and forth in my mind of like, man, I don't know if she's, I don't know if she's ready for it. I've, should I be doing more? Should I be doing less with her? And I, that's when I have to remind myself and go, you know how many people you've told don't let stuff like that dictate yeah. your, your, your progress. So that's where I got to listen to myself once in a while and go, well, we'll get, we'll get there when we get there. She's made great progress. 
She's not where she needs to be quite yet. She's getting close. And I always say we're slowly getting there because yeah. we are. But it's been slow. And part of the reason it's slow is because of the way I train. Yeah. You know, I could have done it a lot faster. I, I, but th that's what I appreciate about you and why, you know, we continue to have conversations uh, about this stuff is you're open and honest about your method or and just how you are slower at, at all of this pretty much because you go a, a, about it a different way and a different outlook yeah and i appreciate that and and what we're talking about on these trials specifically with makina uh we're talking about the cover dog trials yeah. which for those listening that aren't maybe aren't familiar with this these are wild bird trials Gr on, on, cover, on rough yeah. grouse these yeah. aren't pen raised birds oh. And and so the difference between the derby and the shooting dog is you do have to have that fully steady dog. And uh, it's interesting because you're not shooting the bird. So, you, you know, it's like, yeah, it's technically two release. But, you know, you, it, it says, correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't run one yet. I'm hoping to this year if the timing works out uh, better. But the dog goes, finds a bird, points, yep. you go flush it. Do you shoot a shoot, popper? Yeah, it, you guys shoot a blank. Okay, you shoot yep. a blank. And then the dog's still supposed to stand so through the blank. You gotta stand through it. You gotta stand through the shot. And then you go back to the dog and then you release the dog. Um, typically though, you know, because there's a course. It's a, and when I say course, so I'm, I'm very new to it. Um, it's really interesting to me. I'm learning so much from the, it's a great group of people mm -hmm. in, the, in these cover dogs. Um, and we're, we're a pocket, like it, it's the Minnesota grouse dogs, the Chippewa Valley and the Moose River. It's three clubs that are very unique in that they kind of work, they work together on a lot of stuff. They have their own, they have their own individual clubs that act independently, but they, they have realized, I think the value in working together, uh, both from a, like a manpower standpoint, but also from like a, 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 there's a collaboration involved that allows the three clubs to get a lot more done in a, in a, in a better way, I would say a better way and an easier way. Um, because it's a, it's an awful lot of work. These trials are a huge undertaking. Like it's just, it's all volunteer stuff. So it's like, it's tough. And these three clubs have such a wealth of knowledge in them. And the do so for me, the value is I learn so much uh, by observing, by talking with, by being involved with. I actually get a little bit of a sense of pride of being able to kind of give back a little bit and be a part of this. For sure. Um, it's a huge, it, uh, the tradition and the history behind it is so, so great and so rich. And, um, but our little region is kind of unique. And this next year, this coming fall actually is, I just wrote a, uh, wrote something up for the group, um, to go on the website because we were hosting our region um, through the collaboration of the three clubs is hosting the grand national grouse trial which is the big one i mean it's the, it's it's the it's the big one as Super far Bowl. as the, yeah and and historically it's never been in wisconsin and so it's never been further west than michigan and so it's made up of the 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 grand is made up of three regions and the the region that we're in is considered Great Lakes region, but it's never gone west of, I think it's Meredith, Michigan is, is the trial grounds. And we're gonna host it this year. Okay. And so we've had some meetings and like the three clubs are kind of collaborating to put the committee together to do it. And we really are putting a big effort into it because it's something that's a real honor. It's, I'm, I'm a buddy of mine, Chris By, who's the president of the Minnesota Grouse Dog Association. He and I were asked to be the reporters for it. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, but I got off track there, but like that group of people has great dogs. Uh, the type of dogs that I like, uh, it's where, you know, she is, she is, Makina is out of Northwoods bird dogs, Jerry Coulter's and uh, Jerry and Betts's breedings. And they're, they're really well known for those cover dogs. Um, not to say that they don't, because it, she's a line breeding out of a dog named Ridge Creek Cody, which was a horseback, you know, trial dog. So it's not like she doesn't have the capabilities of running those those bigger type events. But like I don't do that, right? And I I don't really have an interest in I hunt her in the woods. So that's the type of trial that's interesting to me. The wild bird aspect is everything for me. Like I I. I'm not, there's nothing against put down birds, um, liberated birds. Just stuff. don't appeal to you. It's just not my, it's just not my preference. And there is something about knowing that you're running on, on real wild birds, because I just think that there is, 
it's the purest and i wish and in in to be honest like we the field trial world at one time was all wild birds unfortunately we don't have the ability to do that everywhere in the country now so we have to in order to keep doing it you you, you adjust but like it's so it's so pure and so right to me that that's that's a big interest of mine with her yeah. and i mean something you know where i live at i if i do if i compete in a wild bird trial it doesn't exist where i'm at yeah. i have to travel up north and and it's tough to take the time take the money to travel 10 to 12 hours up north to oh, yeah. come do a wild bird trial i want to do one you know win or lose get my butt kicked i don't care i want the experience of it i want yeah. to see it uh but being able to consistently do that that's just not in the cards for myself or the average person right besides like a one-off thing but i think what you're talking about is like it's okay to have your preference and you know it doesn't have to be like you said you prefer the wild bird trials other people are in a, in different situations and it's like go play the game that you want but i'm with you to where while I do NASTRA now, I'm doing UFTA now, like I'm doing different little fun trials and competitions, there's something about the appeal of a wild bird trial that those don't really touch on for me. And But that's also because I put such an emphasis on wild bird hunting, that relationship yeah. between bird and dog. That's what I'm really after. You know, I want that bond with the dog so that we can go into the woods and chase a wild bird that doesn't have any human scent on it. There's no four-wheeler scent. You know, fill in the blanks. There's yeah. a, a million ways to go about it. And you said the purity factor of it, like that factors into it for me. And, and that's, that's what appeals to me about it. And uh, it's interesting that, you know, Again, you're not really knocking the Penrays bird game, but it's just not your preference uh, because you never really got into that in the lab side of the world, right? Like this is no, your never, first true competition. I've never competed with a dog before. And, and I, I, so I feel like with the beauty of one of the things I really enjoy about the cover dog stuff is I, I really feel like cover dog uh, and it might be with the other bird dog stuff too field trials but like the i know for a fact i can speak to the cover dog stuff that it's a test it's a test for the dog it's a test of the dogs so we're we're really now the handler is an important factor because there are some that have a real knack for showing the dog they show the dog well they they they're they have an understanding of what judges are looking. It's a very subjective game. There's okay. no, there's no, you don't get points for stuff. Like it's, it's, it is completely, and this is where it is. Some would say this is not fair. I think it is the definition of fair because it is a game that is, it is a game that's important, but it is something that it's very driven by like different judges will have different preferences now there is a standard of like what they want to see in it's the whole idea is to create dogs for breeding purposes what dogs are good to breed and so you're you're measuring that judging that based based basing things on that but the best to me I, I look at it and i go just because a dog wins doesn't necessarily mean to me that it's the one i want to breed to like the thing about showcasing these dogs and walking these braces is I get to see these dogs work on wild birds and there might be certain parts. It might not be the winner, quote unquote, or the champion of that particular event, but it, it might be a runner up or it might not have even placed, but it's showcased what it is that I'm looking for from a breeding, if I was a breeder. But the thing about the thing about the whole, the, 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 sh the showing of the dog to me, it's the dog. The dog has to win. Handlers don't win these. Mm. And so I think it's really interesting when you talk to people. And I find it in retriever stuff, and this is not a, a, a bash on retrieving stuff, retriever stuff. But, like, I do think that the best trainers usually win. The, I think the trainers are real influential in the retriever games. The dog has to have abilities to do these things but i think most of them do i think the best trainers usually are the most they train the dogs the best and the and then they win 
And I look at it and I go, take if you took the trainers out, I'd really like to know, like, if you took all those dogs and you put them in the hands of people that were average dog owners, I'd like to see which ones, how they turn out. Because if, like, I have a dog right now that my labs will, ne will never, like, have credentials of winning stuff because we don't enter into any of that stuff. But, like, I've got a dog right now that I 100% intend to breed to. He's from, he's, he's line bred out of dogs from, for a, a couple generations of ours, but he belongs to my son and my son is not a trainer and my son has been around dogs long enough to really get it but he's not a trainer and he's he'll be the first person to admit it but he's turned that dog into such a fine dog with such little effort and that dog will hunt with any dog and and people wow that's a really i had that dog at a, i had that dog at a show uh the ata show it came down for but like it's such a fine dog with such little training that's the type of dog i want to breed the bird dog stuff is we're looking at the cover dog stuff we're looking at dogs doing very natural things that we didn't i can't train her to be a winner she's either is or she isn't in that game some of those handlers are so good at being able to understand what you got to, what the judge has to see in order for the dog to win. And that's the difference where I just think that we, to me, I want to really have, if you're judging stuff on dogs and you're using it for purposes of breeding, whatever the game is, as long as it's like focused on the dog, I, Jerry Coulter's her breeder. And I had this conversation with him and I said, Jerry, one of the things that I pick up about you, and this is, this is a while back when we were talking, I said, Whenever you talk about, because he's won a lot, he, he he won a hell of a lot of cover dog stuff in the in the days. He doesn't do it. He doesn't do it anymore, or hasn't done it for some time. But he's still involved with the clubs and he's doing some judging and stuff. But he's not running dogs. He's not competing dogs. He's campaigning, but he did and he did it hard and he's a winner and he he won. Him and Betsy, they won. I always say to him, I never hear you talk about what you won. It's never a conversation of, I won this or I won that. I won this, I won that. It's this dog won this, this dog won that. And he, and I told him that. And I said, that's what, that's what I love hearing is because it's not, you're not doing it intentionally. I've just picked up on it. That's how you talk. These dogs win this stuff for you. And he goes, yeah, you want to hear a funny story? There was a, I ran against this other guy and we went and they ended up, I think it was a callback and the two of them ran a race together. And the, the other guy's dog, took a step was picked up jerry's dog pointed to bird handled everything really well named the winner so guy says to jerry as they're walking by and the guy's not real happy about it with his dog and the guy looks at jerry and says well i guess you won that one and jerry said i turned and looked at him and said no dog won that one and and a lot of that's so simple and that makes such sense but so f listen 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 in the future of how many people you hear talk about what they won yeah, they didn't win shit. <laughs> that's like me telling. That's like me on Sunday, on uh, Monday morning in Green Bay, because everybody tells me how we did this yesterday and we did that. Not a single person dressed up as a Packer on Sunday, <laughs> but we in Green yeah. Bay are all the Packers. Yeah. So like, I I I laugh at that sometimes, and I go, it's the it's the dog, and that yeah. that is where that cover dog thing, I think, is really accurate. And I think well, it's I think I think to your point, it. Because there is training that goes into it, right? Like, you you do have to get the dog fully steady, right? Yeah, that part of it is. That, yeah. that part of it is. But I, I would agree that in the actual trial itself, again, I haven't been there myself, but just loose understanding and, and picturing it is you are just letting that dog loose and going on a hunt, right? And so it, it's up to that dog to, you know, succeed or fail. And but you still do have the training aspect and there is, there is a, yeah, a number there, there's connection. a number of ways that you can train these dogs that do impact the enthusiasm and style right so yes. there there are yeah there there are principles that go into the training aspect to where i get i get what you're saying on the lab side to where yeah when you're playing those games the best trainer that knows the game and all that like that is much more handler involved than what you're doing on the cover dog trial but I would say that, like, if you if you're Jerry Coulter and you have the knowledge and you have the experience and 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 you know how to progress the dog through that training, I would say that you know, 
that he built that dog to be able to perform on Super Bowl Sunday, right? Like, you know, yeah, it's semantics I just don't think, again. I just don't think it's – I think it's like – so the, the, the difference is – this is my opinion. People ask me all the time, what's easier for you to train? Yeah. Your labs or that setter? Well, I, I think – if it were, if you were, an, if you never owned a dog before, and you wanted to train your dog to hunt, now, got to remember, what are my objectives with the with the bird dog? It's to hunt birds. It's it's upland. With the labs, it's I'm doing shed hunting with them. I'm tracking with them. I'm doing gun dog stuff with them. I'm doing some. Some of them were doing flushing. Some of them were doing upland, but they're just at heel and picking for picking up for me. So there's there's. If you ask me, if you if you say which one's easier to train for the specific purpose, upland with the upland dog with the pointy dog, or let's just say let's narrow it down to one thing, which would be gun dog, ducks and water, you know, ducks and geese, waterfall stuff. I would say if, if you've never had a dog before and you want to know which one's easier to do with no training experience, it's a hundred percent the bird dog. Absolutely, because there is nothing you got to buy the right one. That's the hardest part. If you, <laughs> right. if you buy the right one, if you buy the right bird dog, your job's pretty easy. You're setting it up and, and just, you're not even really steering. It. It's like you, you do the right setup at the right time and, and the dog will do it for you. Opportunity, essentially. Opportun- if you give them the right opportunities, they'll, you'll have yeah. a nice bird dog. I, I can't tell you how many people I know have good bird dogs that, they're not much as like as far as and they'll say it themselves. I'm not saying it negative about them, but they'll say I'm not much of a trainer. No. But now, now, that's the hunting part of it. That setter of mine, I trained with a with a foundation of obedience, the same as my lab. Because does it help with me? And does it help us in the field? I I certainly don't think it hurts, and I think it helps to a, to a degree. It does hunting. But it makes it very nice to do this, a show yeah. like this. It makes it very nice to have her in the house. It makes it very nice to take her camping. It, it's I, So I, for me personally, I don't have an option with that. They're going to always have to have that because then for to enjoy them as a family dog, yeah. which all my dogs it, are family it's dogs. It's a companion gotta dog. Have, I, I got to have that no matter what. So take that aside. Like, I don't think you can not train them at all. Right. And, and get the st- get, for me, I can't train, not train them at all. But like the bird part of it, I. Well, man, there, just, there, just there's re- too. It's too formal. The retriever stuff is too formal. Yeah, you're asking them to do way too many things that are not natural to them. Well, and that's what I was just gonna say. Is like let's rewind, you know, six, seven decades back in the day where the average upland hunter had the setter or pointer out in the kennel in the backyard that they didn't really do much with yeah. during the off season, you know, that, and when they're puppies, they may expose them up to birds, sure. you know, put that, put that foundation that you're just talking about. You have to have a little bit of something in them. Yeah. And then they just went and hunted and then they had quality bird dogs, yeah. you know, hunting yeah. bird dogs. Yeah. And then conversely, the lab guys, the guys that were playing the game, they didn't just go stick their labs or retrievers out in a kennel and only touch them during duck season. It was constant year round. You know, you have to build that that machine, mm-hmm. and it, it goes to show like what you're asking the dog to do. Like that, this over here, the retriever stuff, takes more time, more reps, more more manipulation by us. Yeah. Where with a bird dog, if all you want is a pointer to go hunt, point birds, and you shoot birds, it doesn't take that much to get that level of dog. Right, right, and I, that's where when you start talking about measuring them in competition. I do think it's a, a more desirable format for me in that bird dog mm-hmm. space versus the retriever stuff. Cause it's more natural. Yeah. It's it, and, and to me, that's the purpose. Now, if the purpose is to win stuff, if the purpose is to gain value in monetary for monetary purposes of breeding or collect ribbons or whatever it is, then I get it. It's different. But like for me, the trial, if you go back and read the, you know, all the old stuff about the reasoning for trials and the reason they did them in the first place, it really is for integrity of the breed. It's to, it's to, it's to weed out the best of the best to, to, to carry on what you want in that type of dog. Yeah. And so, and I like that. And I like that history part of it. And I think it's held 
held pretty true. And but in, then you have to ask the question: At what point? Where is that line that training overshadows genetics? Right. Right. You know, right. Th- which, that, which is tough. which is a lot harder. So I feel like that's a lot harder to fluff in the bird dog <laughs> world. You can't. That dog cannot be trained to run. You can't train a dog to bird Love find. Birds. You can't train a dog to look the way it looks on point or the way it looks through the woods. A lot of that is impactful on the winner. Yeah. The the winner has to if the, if the winner doesn't hold its tail the right way and look the right way as far as intensity on point, he might not he might find more birds, but he doesn't look exactly the way they want him to look. So he's yeah, he's good. He's good at this, but he's not he's not the best at that. And there's like a whole list and that's the subjectivity of it. There are a lot of judges that have different and I love listening to as many of them that are willing to say what they like. Because, and some people, I think it probably bugs because there are different, there are different preferences out there and there are different, there are different ideas of what they should be and shouldn't be. And that's where it's like, there's no perfect dog. There's no, because it kind of depends on where, where you're running it and who you're running it in front of. And, but like, I look at it and I go there, but there are some consistent things. And like, what I really like about her is. I don't know that she'll ever win. I don't, I don't, I don't. If you ask me today, I'll tell you, I don't think she'll win much. She certainly won't win based on power because she's not a real powerful dog where I see some winners. I see some of these dogs that are just so powerful, so athletic, so impressive. Their build is just amazing. But what I, what she does have going for her, and this is, uh, I'm I'm biased, but what she does have going for her is they always they describe her as she's real fancy, she's real finesse, she's, she's beautiful to watch, she's so easy on the eye, she's so what I what I think and I've said this from the very beginning and have I influenced it in her training? I'm not I'm I'm going to tell you right now I'm not that good of a trainer. I can't train a bird dog to not be a bird dog. I can't train a bird dog to not run out and find birds. You can put as much obedience in them as you want. You're never going to take that out of them. I don't believe you can. So. But she probably, she hunts exactly how I want her to hunt. I don't think she'll, I don't want her getting out super far. I don't use collars. I don't even run her with a GP. I have, I've quit running her with a GPS. I don't even run her on a GPS anymore because it forces me to, to really stay connected to her. Dude, that's, that's really interesting. I've, I've talked about this where I don't do it all the time. I use my tracking collar. 99% of the time, especially like on actual hunting yeah. and, and unfamiliar areas. But I love doing fun runs or in my backyard, I have this abandoned plant nursery that when the woodcock flights are in, yeah. holds a woodcock. I love going out there and simulating a hunt without a tracking collar because it forces me to pay attention. And I feel like you get to know your dog on a much deeper level on their behaviors, what their tent, your, their tendencies to do this or go there. It's like, you're getting in the head of the dog a little bit better. And so like I go out without a tracking collar or belt again, controlled environment controlled as you can get yeah. out in the woods but i know it's safe like there's no yeah. roads there's no this and I also i trust my dogs to when yeah. i recall they're going to come back so obviously have that built in don't somebody listen to this don't just go drop your dog off in the middle and be like oh, i'm gonna yeah. go get to know my dog but i think there's so much value in that right there to where like if you're if your only connection with your dog a hundred percent of the time in the woods is through that screen and you're always able to know where your dog is by looking at that screen or looking at your watch, I think that there there's missed opportunities sometime or, or I don't know, it, it's like you're missing out on a connection with that dog to where it kind of harkens back to, you know, years ago, decades ago, generations ago where people they didn't have these screens or sure. tracking collars. They, they just went out and hunted their dogs. They may have had a bell, but right. you it's know. A, I think it's a security blanket for yeah. a lot of people that uh, doesn't allow me to fully grow as a handler. And I, and I, I'll never run her without a bell because I need, she pushes distance that, that great that like, I won't find her if I don't. And, <laughs> right. and, and I find myself becoming 
real anxious. If she's not, if she doesn't have a bell and she runs off, I know she's probably not that far away, but I have this anxiety inside of me because I don't know where she is. Where I, when I hear the bell, I'm with her. And I feel like, so I, I do love that part. I, I was real hesitant. I never felt like I'd have a runoff dog. I, I just, I've, I've got that confidence in her, but that was earned. You know, that I, it, it takes time, I think, for them to, for you to feel that confident in it. Oh, absolutely. But I feel, I never thought about it. And that only reason I, a friend of mine who field trials, he's a pro actually, sent me a, a message. Um, Paul Cook, Alder, Alder Fork. Mm -hmm. He sent me a message one day and he said, hey, you should check out um, this guy. He trains without a collar and um, been doing it a long time. He's really, really good. And you, you'd probably be able to learn some things talking with him. And so he said, he's the only guy I know of in the, in the circuit or whatever today that runs without a, runs out. You, Cause so in the field trials, you can, you can put a GPS collar on them. Can't put a training collar on them, but you could put a GPS on them. You just can't use it. You, you have to give the, you have to give the yeah, handheld to, to the judge. judge and, so I, and, and guys will have to sometimes get their control, get their handhelds and find their dog because they lost their dog. And and sometimes they're on point. They're just so far out. They weren't they weren't able to, to find them. Sometimes they run off. But so I don't have that concern with her. I don't think she's she's not going to do that. But I never but I always had the GPS on her. Partially because she was pretty young and I was still developing that confidence. But the other reason was in the back of my head. And this is going to sound stupid, but. I thought to myself, this is the game part of it. I thought, if I don't have a GPS on her, will those judges think that she's such a boot-looking dog that she that I don't need a GPS? I questioned that. I thought about that. So I thought, well, I better put a GPS on her. I And perception matters in a game yeah, like of totally. subjectivity. That's part of the game. Yeah. So, But but when, when Paul sent me this message, it's a guy in Michigan that does it. He said, he's the only guy I know of that runs – runs in a trial without a without a gps so i said well i've been thinking i think i can do it and i've thought i could do it forever why i'm gonna do that because i really for me it's a confidence thing and i if it if it if it makes it again she's never so i don't know that she's gonna win and i certainly don't know that she's gonna i know she's not gonna win because of her dominating power but i do think what will happen is, is if she's ever to become a, a dog in that world that becomes quote unquote winning it'll be because she finds birds she handles the birds well like that's part that's a really important part of the game and she's gonna look good doing it she never and so now that's that's maybe not the whole puzzle that's maybe not the whole all the pieces of it but she's got a lot of them and and the other thing that i keep thinking is is like i don't know a damn thing about this yet because it's, it's so early and Jerry told Jerry Quilter told me a couple of things that have always come true. He, he's quite a mentor. Uh, for me, he's quite a mentor, and he has taught an awful lot in a short period of time to me. But he told me he said, "There's a couple of things that I can guarantee you. One is she's going to become more cautious around birds the older she gets. Second one is is she's going to run bigger the older she gets." Well, when I was if you she's she turned two in November, so she's almost a year and a half. If you went a year back from now, this time last year, if there was two things on my mind that I was like, ah, th these are kind of not worrying me, but I'm thinking about them, it would be, I wish she'd run a little bit bigger and I wish she'd be a little more cautious around the birds because she just, she just wasn't quite yet. Yeah. And so Jerry said, well, those, and I didn't prompt that in the conversation. He told me. And so I said, well, Jerry, I wish you'd have told me this a lot earlier because that has been the thing that I've been thinking about now for months. And he goes, yeah, it'll it, come. It Don't worry about itself, it. Yeah. And so sometimes it is a, in, it is a, it's a battle inside ourselves. We fight ourselves a lot. I do. I fight myself. I go back and forth on stuff. And I, I, when I, when it comes to like decision-making and what's the next step and, one of the biggest, the other thing that I would say that I've realized with that dog in particular is, and I won't, I'll, I'll, I'll get better the next dog because of it is, I just won't be so hesitant to do things with her. I was real, I'm always real hesitant to try something, try something new, take the next step, because it's all new to me. It's all foreign, and, and I don't think that's an, I think that's a pretty natural thing. But 
what I have realized is they're no different, in my opinion, to any other dogs. And I, I've got the experience more with the retrieving stuff, but they're pretty, you can't, they're, they're pretty, they're not fragile. Like you're not going to break them. No. And, and, and sometimes, um, that hesitance and fear in me to do something because I wasn't quite sure it just held me back from doing it, held me back from doing it. And then when I finally got the guts to do it, I thought, boy, I should have done this a while ago when I first was thinking about it, but I was just too chicken, you know? So I, they're pretty resilient and, and I'll become, that's something I'm learning from her. And I'll, I think I'll probably get better. I'll no. get better in the future with her on it. I hope I'll definitely get better on the next one. Yeah. And that's because of it. That's all any of us handlers can hope to do is learn from the ones that we have, get better for the next ones. And yeah. that's why every single dog should get better. Uh, assuming that the genetics and you yeah. do your job, you know, finding the right one to begin with, you know, yeah. bring it full circle to, to where we kind of started on this. But Jeremy, I, you know, I'm glad we're finally able to connect and do yeah. something in person for once, for sure, you know, I, I, something new that I've been doing, uh, with all the guests is, uh, uh to wrap this up, what's something I should have asked you that I didn't kind of let it, let you take it to where, wherever you want to go. And then oh, we can, man. we can tie this one up. What, what should you have asked me that you didn't? What, what's this a, a mental booger that's been you you think that just needs to be addressed in the gun dog world or touched on or or just highlighted reminder um well i'll just sound really boring with it <laughs> but like i do think well it this is going to just bore everybody it's just gonna uh they're gonna oh not that again but like being patient yeah we don't we don't talk about patience enough i don't think I, I don't think it, it, you could, it is boring and it is a, um, it is something that isn't always, it isn't as exciting to talk about, but I do think that it's the root of a lot of problems is the lack of patience. And I, I, for a long, long time, I would be able to preach that and be, I'd feel pretty good about it because I've, I, I practiced what I preached. I have found myself caught myself being impatient with my progress with that, with this new dog, with this setter. And so I, I should, I need to listen to it myself. So in order to, you gotta kind of get into that mindset. So speaking it is one thing. So slow down, I, I have to be patient. Now, I just said, you know, I, I, I don't, I think there's a difference between patience and fear or hesitation to do something. The patience, when I say the patience part of it, I mean like, it's just, She's just a puppy. Yeah. She's just, you know, she's two and a half years old. And I think that this is, a, I listened to a podcast, um, Bruce, Bruce Minard, Menard. He's from mm. Michigan. Um, he's a, he's a cover dog guy. And I listened to a podcast that he was on. I really thought it was great. He, I was really, it was some really good stuff. I heard him talk about, about field trials. He was talking a lot about field trials. And when I heard him talk about some of the differences between the pointers and the setters, and he started, it was the ages that I was so tuned into because that's the life I'm living right now with a dog that's a little over two that's going to, I'm on the fence of running her as a cover dog because she's not quite ready and all this. And so he talked about that a little bit, really indirectly, but he mentioned a few things that made such sense. But to hear it from a guy that's with this experience and, su and very successful in this world, and to hear him talk about it, and he was so not concerned because with the age of the dogs you know i will run them i know they're not they're not probably going to win they're not ready for that quite yet but you know we'll run them and we'll get them experience and like for me personally it's getting myself experience like there's the value in running her because i have i have no i have very little experience and there's a it's a very different feeling to handle a dog in a trial than it is to take your dog out and train with it it's a there's a gallery there there's all sorts of stuff inside of you especially that in this you know that you're going out there and right. they're judging you your literally goal. have judges <laughs> judging you who likes to be judged you know right so so this is like in the literal sense there's judges but then there's a whole gallery of people watching and and if you if you're like me or maybe if you're not like me but a lot of people have a lot of pride in their dog and they want to show their dog yeah more. so but then anyway, enters the the competition to you know not have a good dog. They want to show. They want to show how, how good their dog is because they're you know we're proud of our dogs. So, but Bruce, that in that interview, he, he made some points that made me realize that back to that idea of patience. 
and just let her develop as she develops and stick with her. Don't give up on her. You know, don't, don't get frustrated. Just keep moving. And that's that idea of like, just as long as we're making progress and, and it's perspective because it's, it's like fitness. It's like a lot of things that you don't see the progress in the short term, but you will recognize it in the bigger chunks. And so as, as, as non-productive or as non, we're not, we're not changing the way I hoped as quickly as we'd hoped. And then I take a step back and I go, yeah, but back up three months ago, yeah, I'd have been thrilled three months ago if you told me we were going to be doing this right now. But in the moment, I'm going, why well, can't we get this next thing? Up? And and so in three months, and then I think, and then I sit back and I go, yeah, and I just talked about a three month window like it was something. Well, blink your, you know, snap your fingers. It's going to be three months. Yeah, it goes so fast. I, I personally think impatience kind of derives from not trusting the process you're you, it's like we don't whether it's trust in ourselves yeah. trust in our approach trust in the dog fill in the blank we're, we're always thinking we're not doing enough we're not doing it right we're not doing it fast enough we're fill in the blank but if you trust the process like mm -hmm. trust your intuition trust your dog trust the approach right. that you're going it naturally it's like it's okay to slow down and not be rushing all the time. We have to get this. We have to get that. No, just trust that kind of what Jerry was telling you, that'll come yep. naturally. Yep. Just yep. trust in the genetics, trust in the process, yep. and, faith, and you're going to get me, there. To me, the word is faith. Having faith. Faith is a really interesting thing. Right. <laughs> Everyone should have some. <laughs> and, and, it, and, and I mean it like on all sorts of levels. But that word to me has become more and more important in my life for Lots of reasons, dogs and and outside of it. But the the idea of having faith, they are a true test of it. These dogs are a true test of one's faith, and you can't bullshit them. You know, you can't you can't trick them, and and you can't trick yourself when it comes to that. And so, the idea of trust, and when you use when you start using words like that, those are the most important things to me when it comes to training, developing that developing trust faith connection that that is a different side of training than the mechanics and there's a per, there's a need for both and i think we get good at the mechanics usually first and we get experience tweaking that but then we recognize like to go to that next level to be able to do what you want to do you got to take that pick it up, put it in your pocket and bring it with you. But then you got to start figuring out how to trust them, feel connected with them, have faith in them. They'll have faith. They give it back to you. If you give it to them, you'll, you'll see it in them. You know, yeah. what it is. You know how it is. So, so I, I think rabbit hole away, but uh, that word, that, that boring idea, <laughs> you have to keep, you have to keep talking about it because to me, it's some of the most important no matter, no matter what, it's, it's the foundation, in my opinion, and no matter what activity it is outside of dogs and everything, no matter what venture, activity, hobby, what, whatever it is in life, the foundations of anything become boring to, right. to whoever participates in it. So yeah. I don't think there's a way to, you know, anything to touch on better than that to wrap this up. I, yeah. I enjoyed this. Anybody interested, I'm going to have all Jeremy's links and Dog Bone Hunter and his podcast and, and, that, and all this stuff down in the show notes. So just look down there if you're interested. But uh, again, enjoyed enjoyed doing this for, face to face for the as first always. Time. Yeah, I, it was it. The next couple of days, I I think are great to be able to because you know we how many times have we talked? Uh, three, three or four, four, I think yeah. something. And so I feel like. Every time I've talked with you, I've felt more comfortable. You know, you develop yeah. relationships. And so, but now you, you, when we see each other, when you break bread with each other, when you have a few drinks with each other, like it, it becomes, it's just, it's a process of, of growing that relationship and that it's easier. And so I appreciate you doing it. Yeah. I appreciate what you're doing with, with this podcast. Absolutely, man. I, I enjoy it every time we get together and, you know, maybe one day we'll get to share a trial field or nice. something. Uh, it should come up there. We'll, we'll, we're, we're actually going to have some, I think this year, our weather has been great. And hey, you again. know, don't, don't twist my arm. You know, I've done crazier things. I, I, I would like to do it. It's just, you know, finding the time and, and yeah. the resources to, to make that happen. Sure. Never say never with me. Yeah, right. Cool. So, all right, man. Thank you, dude. Yep, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Yep.